Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to talk to you today about our work on the robustness on secure federated learning. So recently, there has been increased interest in collaborative machine learning paradigms that aim to train machine learning models without needing direct access to training data. And one prominent type of this paradigm is federated learning, where the training process is distributed across a large number of devices that collaborate to train a joint global model. So a key benefit to this approach is that it results in more control for clients because they share less data and this data exchange is targeted for a specific task. But also many large players in industry are drawn to this approach because it allows them to substantially reduce data liability issues while still being able to take advantage of their users' data. And so despite its novelty, federated learning is already being used in many applications. But federation by itself does not bring many privacy benefits, and the high dimensional updates from clients actually still leak all sorts of information. And so it did not take much time until people came up with attacks that allowed the reconstruction of training examples from these updates from clients. So to remedy some of these issues, federated learning can be used in combination with secure aggregation, in which clients encrypt their local updates and the server can decrypt the final sum. So today we have secure aggregation protocols that are tailored to deal with the practical deployment constraints of federated learning, which often involves a large number of unreliable and resource constraints clients. So one of the issues that these secure FL systems still do not address is malformed updates from malicious clients. And in fact, the privacy properties of these systems make malicious updates harder to detect. So in this work, we address this issue by introducing a new protocol that allows clients to prove constraints on their encrypted updates in a privacy-preserving way. But before we could do that, we needed to understand what constraints could even be helpful for robustness. So that is what I will focus on in the first part of this talk. So what type of attacks have we seen in federated learning so far? So the goal of these attacks is to influence the behavior of the global model for a specific set of samples. And we have seen two types of adversaries in FL, the data poisoning adversary and the model poisoning adversary. So the data poisoning adversary only controls the training data set of the clients, for example, by injecting some malicious samples of Swiss cows that are labeled as dogs. So the compromised clients still follow the training process honestly, and so this is similar to an attack that we've seen in the centralized machine learning setting, which is also called data poisoning. But in federated learning, adversaries are not limited to only data poisoning, because clients have direct access to model parameters, which allows them to perform stronger and more adaptive forms of attacks. And so in model poisoning, the adversary can craft an arbitrary malicious update, for instance, using a custom training function for some malicious objective. And model poisoning is a very severe and practical attack, because it allows a single client that is compromised in a single round to fully overtake the training process. And so if we want to be able to deploy FL in a scenario where we don't fully trust all of the clients, we definitely need to be able to mitigate these types of attacks. And so the reason for this is that these attacks exploit the linear aggregation process by scaling their update with a scaling factor to amplify their update to make sure that it overpowers the other client's contributions in the aggregation process. But this is actually not a new problem. So we know that linear aggregation rules are vulnerable to Byzantine behavior, and this has been studied uh, extensively in the context of distributed machine learning. And here, a single Byzantine worker can uh, force the parameter server to choose an arbitrary vector. But this problem is also known in security, particularly in the context of private data collection systems, where a malicious client can send an encryption of an invalid value. And the general approach taken in security to solve this problem is to rely on zero-knowledge proofs, so the client proves that its submission is well-formed. So what does a well-formed su submission in federated learning look like? Well, because these attacks rely on scaling, if you look at the updates of malicious clients, they are clearly much larger than the updates of the benign clients. And so a natural question to ask is, can we prevent these scaling attacks by simply enforcing a bound on the norm of clients? And indeed, for single-shot attacks, we see that norm bounds can be effective. But for stronger attacks, it still remains unclear whether the norm bound is effective. And this has actually been debated in some recent work, uh, but each work shows different results on whether or not the norm bound is a good defense against model poisoning. And so we wanted to investigate the reason for this apparent conflict. So we resolved this conflict by showing that whether or not the norm bounds are effective depends on the attack objective. So some of the attacks looked at prototypical attack targets and some looked at tail targets. And this is significant because modern data sets often follow long tail distributions where a large fraction of the distribution consists of atypical samples that make up the long tail. 
And we now know that large overparameterized deep learning models actually tend to allocate a large part of their model capacity to memorize or, or learn these behaviors for these long tail data samples in order to achieve good accuracy. So the consequences of this effect has been studied in the context of memorization and privacy leaks, but in our work we con consider the impact it has on robustness. So to do this, we compared the three state-of-the-art targeted adaptive model poisoning attacks, which are specifically designed to circumvent the norm bound. There's also other dimensions that we looked at in the paper, but today I will focus only on the attack objective. So to see this effect, in the left plot here, we look at the attack success as training progresses. We can see that for attacks on prototypical targets, a suitable norm bound can actually successfully prevent the attack. Of course, when the bound is too loose, we can see that the adaptive attacks do work. But now if we look at the effect of the same attack, but for tail targets, we can see that the behavior is different. So we still see here that prototypical attack doesn't work, but if we look at the attack on tail targets, we can see that it's slowly being injected over time, even when a norm bound is in place. So what is also interesting is that the, the model poisoning attacker, uh, the performance of this attack compared to the data poisoning attacker is quite similar. And the data poisoning attacker doesn't rely on scaling and follows the training protocol honestly. So this seems to suggest that um, the model is just learning the behavior of the attack as it would learn the behavior for any other tail subpopulation. So we might be tempted now to think about, okay, how can we prevent the model of pre preventing to learn these still subpopulation behaviors? And actually we have quite a lot of techniques for that, such as noise addition through differential privacy. But unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. Um, because this leads to uh, a, s a significant reduction in accuracy and also leads to issues with fairness. And so it, it seems to be quite hard in general to defend against these types of attacks. But to summarize, summarize our found findings on the norm bound as a defense, we can see that it can defend against a large class of very practical attacks. But whether the norm bound is also a viable solution for secure federated learning really depends on whether it's efficiently realizable in combination with secure aggregation, which is what we explored next. So the goal here is to augment existing secure federated learning protocols with the ability to enforce predefined constraints on model updates in a privacy preserving way. And to achieve, to achieve this, we adapt secure aggregation to support correctness under malicious clients and then extend it to support scalable zero knowledge proofs. To improve scalability even further, we propose several optimizations, but I will focus on the first two items for the rest of this talk. So there are many ways to build secure aggregation protocols using techniques such as MPC and multi-key FHE. But the approach that seems to be the most suitable for the FL setting is based on additive masking. And in Rofo, we extend this existing tailored secure aggregation protocol with, with zero-knowledge proofs. So this protocol is the one by, proposed by Bonavitz et al. and relies on an additive homomorphic masking scheme where each client blinds its input vector W with a masking vector R derived from pairwise shared secrets. And in the very basic protocol, these masks are derived in such a way that allow them to cancel out during the aggregation, which would allow the server to recover the sum. So the protocol at a high level consists of three stages. So first, in the shared key stage, the clients agree on the pairwise shared keys that are used to generate the masks. Then each client uses this masking value to encode their input and send it to the server. And then the server can add these encodings together using the homomorphic property of the scheme. Then finally, the server constructs a decoding key which includes only the masking values of the clients that haven't dropped out. The actual protocol is a little bit more involved, but at a high level is that the server receives a decoding key, R prime, which it can then use to decrypt the aggregate update. So a limitation of existing secure aggregation is that it only provides input privacy, but not correctness under malicious clients. So for example, a malicious client could use the wrong masking value, which would result in an incorrect output at the server. So before we're going to enforce constraints on client inputs, we definitely need to have correctness first. And achieving this in the existing secure aggregation protocol would mean that clients should prove that their inputs are masked with the correct value. But this would also involve clients having to prove that they followed the share keys protocol correctly. And unfortunately, this is very expensive because it involves many evaluations of a pseudo-random generator. But what we show is that the only thing that we need to make sure for correctness is that the sum of the masking values is equal to the R prime that the server receives from unmask. And so we propose an encoding scheme that allows the server to verify this, this condition efficiently using the homomorphic property of the scheme. 
But before I get into the details of, of how we realize correctness, we actually need another property of our encoding scheme. And that is that we want our encoding to be efficiently compatible with zero-knowledge proofs, because the proof creation will probably be most of the overhead for the clients. And so we need an encoding that is additively homomorphic, but also allows efficient range proofs over large vectors. But zero-knowledge proofs do not always compose well with homomorphic commitments. So for instance, if we look at a SNARK such as GROWTH16, although they're very competitive in terms of overhead, they do not natively operate over homomorphic commitments. And so we have to include the encoding circuit of the commitments into the proof, which significantly increases the prover time. So in ROFO, we use bullet proofs, which can operate directly over homomorphic commitments. And while SNARKs tend to outperform them for general proofs, bullet proofs are highly efficient for the range proofs that we require. And their proof size concretely is also very competitive. So it only takes a few kilobytes for a million range proofs due to efficient range proof batching. So getting back to the encoding, bullet proofs are generally instantiated over Peterson commitments. And to support correctness, we extend this to an Algamal commitment by including a group element with the randomness. This allows the server to homomorphically add up the randomness to check that it's equal to R prime. So with this encoding using Algamal commitments, clients additionally send a bulletproof-based zero-knowledge proof that the server can then verify to check that the update satisfies the norm bound. And in Ruffo, we support both the L-infinity norm and the L2 norm. So for the L-infinity norm, client, the client simply send a bulletproof range proof for each parameter. For the L2 norm, it's a little bit more involved because the clients have to send a proof for the sum of the square of each parameter, but more details on this can be found in the paper. So we implemented Rofo as a prototype and compared its performance with and without optimizations against a secure aggregation as a baseline. So for a model with 270,000 parameters, we can see that the main timing bottleneck is the range proof generation on the client side. With our further optimizations, we can reduce the timing for both the L2 and L-infinity norm significantly. And the bandwidth costs are dominated by the size of the commitments. So the L2 norm optimization can help here because it reduces the number of parameters in the model because we use a form of L2 norm preserving model compression. But for the L-infinity norm, uh, the optimizations only reduce the number of range proofs, which does not impact bandwidth significantly because they only make up a small fraction of the total bandwidth. So as we increase the complexity of the machine learning, um, the timing overhead of Rofo becomes smaller. So in this example of a language model with 800,000 parameters, the timing overhead of Rofo is only a factor of 1.2. The code for the analysis, experiments, and Rofos prototype implementation is available online. Thank you very much for your attention. So I guess a question. Um, it seems like you're using a, a proof system that was both non-interactive and has small proofs. And I'm curious about whether or not those properties are hard requirements in this context, where you're like sending a huge model update over to the server. Right, that's a very good question. Um, so I think the, the, the non-interactivity is uh, quite beneficial in this setting uh, because these, these clients, you know, they're very unreliable. And so also it, by the design of the secure aggregation protocol, it's, it's very much designed to handle uh, clients to, to drop out at any time. So it, it might be uh, more complex to, to implement that a more interactive uh, protocol in practice. Not sure. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, I have one. I guess so, as alluded in the talk too as well, like norm mounts might not be um, adequate to prevent against all sorts of attack. Is there a way to extend the system to like support other type of constraints, but efficiently? Yeah, so that's, that's a very good question. Um, so I think the, the bulletproof proof system uh, is uh, in theory a, a proof system for general constraints. Uh, although they're specifically very efficient for range proofs and, and also the optimizations that we have at the moment are, are specific to, to range proofs. Uh, but it's definitely possible to also support uh, other types of constraints, although we might have to uh, introduce other optimizations in that. So like the performance gain that you get for range proofs, which is this log L um, improvement when you batch the ranges for bulletproof, that might not be uh, possible for other type of constraints. Yes, exactly. So bulletproofs, so they, they use this type of, of uh, folding technique, right, in, in their proofs. And so it, it might actually be applicable to also other forms of constraints, but it's very constraint dependent. And uh, does your system also support dropouts? I guess the uh, secure aggregation protocol that you use that does support dropout. Is the system still resilient to that? 
Right, yes, uh, that's also a very good question. Uh, and yes, our system does also support dropout, so we, um, we really try to look at secure irrigation at the abstraction that I also presented it uh, today. And so all the parts that uh, cover dropout handling are kind of abstracted away in, in that sense, and we only really look at the encoding or, or change the encoding in the secure irrigation. Thank you. Thank you.